I've already shown quite a bit of older code running on the emulator, so I thought I'd try something newer. This is David Murray's Petsky Robots. Now, I don't actually know how to play this game, but it looks like it's working to me. Interestingly, it did actually try and execute one illegal instruction, the 1A instruction, but I just set this to be a no-op and it seemed to work fine. In this series, we're taking the SAP-1, popularised by Ben Eda, and adding a little bit of muscle to the bone to get it to run 6502 code. In the previous videos, we've looked at the W bus, the register bank, and the sequencer controller, but in this video and the next, we're going to focus on the program counter. And if we can get that to work, we may actually be able to see the first couple of instructions executed. Always an exciting time for a new build. You may have noticed I've added some temporary blink and lights to tell us what's going on, but I'll come back to these a bit later. For now, I want to do a deep dive into the program counter on the SAP-1, then expand upon the concepts for the SAP-6502. You might be wondering why I put Count Von Count from Sesame Street and Everlast from the House of Pain on the thumbnail for this video. The answer is that I want you to remember what the program counter does in non-computing terms. The count likes to, well, count. Once I start in counting, it's very hard to stop. Hey, faster, faster, it is so exciting. I could count forever, count until I drop. One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, I love counting, whatever the amount. <laughs> Meanwhile, Everlast from House of Pain likes to jump. Get up to see, jump around, jump around. These are the two main tasks of the program counter, to count and to jump. Now, it turns out that we've already looked at a chip that's perfect for this, the 74HC161. This is what Ben Edy used for the program counter in his build, and I'm planning to use these as well. It has a count enable input for counting up, and it has a parallel load input for jumping around. Perfect. I want to go over the basics of computer memory again, and hopefully this is revision for many of you. I like this image of multiple pigeonholes with different coloured ducts as a metaphor for computer memory, and this is somewhat analogous to what's actually happening inside the chip. In a normal 6502 system, the microprocessor needs to be connected to memory. It has an address bus which specifies a pigeonhole, then it either reads data from or writes data to the memory using the data bus. The read-write control line determines which of these transactions occurs. I want to be able to run Apple II software on this machine, so let's have a look at how the memory is organised in the Apple II. We have the ROM, which is read-only memory, and the RAM, which is random access memory. And there are two very important differences between these types of memory. First of all, the RAM's volatile. That means, when the power goes off, it loses its contents but a power cycle doesn't affect the contents of ROM. The other main difference is actually expressed in its name, read-only memory. This means in regular use, we can't write to this memory. If we do try and write to the memory, the data is just ignored. Random access memory, on the other hand, lets us read and write data at will. The 6502 has 64K of address space, and we want to combine these two memories if we can. The easiest way to do this is through memory mapping. That's where RAM occupies a certain part of the memory address range, and ROM occupies another region. The code in the ROM persists through a power cycle, which means that we can use this for startup code. The 6502 doesn't have a dedicated I.O. system, so that means we generally have to memory map the I.O. devices into the address space. In the Apple II, the first 48K is used for RAM. This is where we store programs, have our video memory, and store intermediates used by the software. We have a small I.O. space. This is used by devices like the disk drive and the keyboard. And in the ROM, we have the basic interpreter and the system monitor. 
This book by Gary Little clearly elaborates how the memory map's defined. The processor itself doesn't need to know this, but we need to know it at a systems level to get it to execute software. I want to go back and have a look at Benita's implementation to see how the program counter and effective address register were done there. Before I do, though, I want to go over some definitions. And these are generalizations, so there are exceptions to the rules here. The program counter is a CPU register which points to the memory location containing the current or next instruction. The effective address register is a CPU register which points to the memory location containing the data for the current instruction. And we need two independent registers to do this so the value in the program counter doesn't get corrupted between instructions. Finally, the memory address register is a CPU register which directly drives the memory address lines on the main system memory, and this can be for either instructions or data. There are some notable exceptions to this. One is implied addressing mode, where the data is already in a register inside the CPU. Another exception is immediate addressing mode, where the data is immediately after the instruction in memory. After fetch, it's the program counter that's actually pointing at the data, not the effective address register. In this implementation in immediate mode, I actually copy the contents of the program counter into the effective address register, then increment the program counter. I do this so that in the execute phase of instructions with data in memory, then the effective address always holds the pointer to that data. Now let's have a look at where these structures are in Ben Eater's design. The program counter and the memory address register are pretty easy to find because they're labeled that way, but the effective address register is a little trickier to find. For most of the defined instructions, the address is actually kept in the lower four bits. So the way it's designed, the lower four bits of the instruction register are in fact the effective address register as well. I don't think Ben explicitly stated that in his videos, but that's my interpretation of the design. If I'm wrong, please let me know in the comments below. This is Ben Eater's program counter. It's just a single 74LS161. Here's the count enable signal for counting. Now let's stomp 10 times. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Ah, ah, ah. Obviously, when it counts, it doesn't need the W bus, it just advances the internally stored number by one. The parallel enable input is connected up to the jump signal, and this causes it to, well, jump. Jim Helwig as the Ultimate Warrior was also kind of partial to jumping as well. In this case, it replaces the internally stored value with the value currently on the W bus. In the SAP1 and the SAP6502, we also want the W bus to be able to see what's on the program counter. This is a problem because the 161 doesn't have tri-state outputs. If we connect it directly to the W bus, it'll interfere with all the other transactions on the W bus that don't require the program counter. Benita uses a 74LS245, which does have tri-state outputs to connect the program counter back to the W bus. That way we can control when the value in the program counter is broadcast on the W bus. I'm actually going to do something quite similar to this in the SAP6502. Moving on to the memory address register, Benita uses this 74LS173. This is connected to a 2 to 1 multiplexer, which is also connected to the dip switches and the output directly drives the address lines. In run mode, you can effectively ignore the dip switches and the multiplexer. The effective address is held in the lower four bits of the instruction register, and the design uses this 74LS245 to write the value back to the W bus. This is under the control of the I-O signal. Finally, we have the system memory which is held in two 74189 memory chips. 
The address comes from the memory address register along this blue pathway. We have the W bus here, and during a write operation, data goes through these two multiplexes into the memory. To read the memory, we need to go through a bank of inverters, then this 74LS245 to get back to the W bus. We can see how everything's connected, but to understand how it works, we need to know how the sequencer coordinates everything. It's actually quite hard to know how it works just by looking at the schematic diagrams. Let's go back to Benita's design for a moment. Just as a quick refresher, here's Benita's sequencer control word. And here are some of the micro instructions he's handwritten for the E squared prom. Many of the signals actually go through this large bank of inverters. So when you see a 1 written on this page, it just means the signal's asserted. It may or may not be inverted depending on whether the signal's active high or active low. By convention, we usually draw a bar over the signals that are active low. I hope this isn't too confusing to those new to this idea. I'm about to go over quite a long example, but I want to go over some of the assumptions in the example. First, we assume the program counter is up to address 3. And second, we assume the memory contents at location 3 is 18 hexadecimal, while the value at location 8 is E2 in hexadecimal. The first two steps are common to all instructions, and this is fetch. Let's say the program counter contains the number 3, and we start at step 0. Here we can see the program counter output and the memory address register input are both asserted. That means on the next positive edge of clock, the 3 in the program counter will be copied into the memory address register, and because of the way it's wired up, it'll be presented to the static RAM. Next, we go to step 1. Here we see that RAM out and instruction in are both asserted, but we can also see that count enable on the program count is asserted. This means on the next positive edge of clock, the 18 at location 3 in the static RAM will be transferred via the W bus into the instruction register, and the upper four bits of this will be presented to the controller sequencer. Simultaneously, because count enables asserted, the number in the program counter will go from 3 to 4. Instruction 18 actually has two parts to it. The upper four bits, or the 1, tells us to perform an LDA, or load A instruction, and the lower four bits, or the 8 in this case, tell us the address. So when the 18 is loaded into the instruction register, the 1 is sent to the sequencer, but the 8 becomes our effective address. Also note that immediate mode addressing is the exception to the rule. With 1 in the instruction register, we know we're going to use LDA for the remaining steps. In step 2, instruction out and mar in are both asserted. On the positive edge of clock, the 8 in the instruction register or effective address register gets transferred via the W bus to the memory address register. Then in normal running mode, this gets presented to the address lines of the static RAM. In step 3 of LDA, we assert RAM out and A in. On the next positive edge of clock, the E2 at location 8 in the static RAM gets transferred via the W bus to the accumulator. And there we have it, the LDA instruction. The machine will go to step 4, but no signals are asserted, so this is effectively a no-op. Well, more specifically, a no-op micro instruction. The machine basically sits this one out. To summarise Ben's design, we have the W bus. And the W bus on the left and the W bus in the middle are actually the same thing, or you can think of them as being connected. This is a slightly unusual way of drawing it, but please bear with me. I want to show the pathway of data from left to right. We have the program counter, which can read from and write to the W bus. We also have the effective address register, which are the lower four bits of the instruction register, and it can read from and write to the W bus also. One of the big differences is that the 161 is capable of counting, but the 173 is just a set of flip-flops. The W bus can write values into the memory address register, and this goes through a multiplexer, then directly drives the address lines on the static RAM. The important point I want to make, though, is that both the program counter and effective address register need to write their contents to the W bus and have it latched into the memory address register before they can drive the address pins on the static RAM. 
Apart from making everything bigger, this is one of the big design changes in the SAP 6502, so take some time to try and understand it. For the SAP 6502, I use 474HC161s as the program counter. This is how I take it from 4 bits up to 16 bits. The output from the 161s go through a pair of 245s. This is similar to Ben's design, except it's for 16 bits instead of 4 bits. But this is where things change a bit. Instead of driving the W bus, these 245s drive two new buses, A bus low and A bus high. Collectively, these supply the 16 bits needed to drive the system memory. I also want the effective address registers to be able to drive the memory. I implement EA low and EA high with some 74HC574s, and I connect their output directly to A bus low and A bus high. In this design, I don't have anything equivalent to Ben Eater's memory address register. Instead, I just allow the program counter or effective address registers to drive the address lines on the main memory. To avoid contention on these buses, the program counter output enables connected to PC select bar while the output enable on the effective address registers are connected to PC Select. This change in polarity means that only one of the register pairs can drive the A bus at any one time. I also need a way of reading these registers back onto the W bus, but I think I'll save that for the next video. In writing the microcode for this machine, I found it necessary to have two sets of effective address registers, and this is mainly for the more complex addressing modes but only the effective address A registers need to control the address lines on the memory. This is the reason I put them in the program counter. I was able to write the microcode so that the effective address B registers never control the address lines, so I've just put them in the register bank. If I get clever, I might be able to get rid of the effective address B registers, but I'll leave that for later. To summarize the difference in the system memory address bus, in the SAP1, the memory address register or the DIP switches directly drive the address lines, and only one of these has access at any one time. While in the SAP 6502, the program counter and the effective address A registers drive the address lines, but only one of these have access at any point in time. I think that's enough on the program counter for this video, I'll just let the ideas sink in a bit. The next video will be much more practical than this one. I'll build and then do the bring up for the program counter. So don't forget to like, share and subscribe, and press the notification bell. Just one final thing, why did I use a 74HC373 as the instruction register? This is an octal latch, but everywhere else I've used octal DTOP flip-flops. Well, let's quickly compare them. If this is our incoming signal, when load's high, the input signal is directly transferred to the output. On the falling edge of the load signal though, Whatever is presented to the input is latched to the output, and it'll stay there until load goes high again. That's why these are sometimes called a transparent latch. If I were to use a 74HC374 in its place, I'd have to use load bar instead of load, and that's because the 373 and the 374 latch on opposite edges of clock. When I present the same signal to the 374, it outputs the data later than the 373. When I do an instruction fetch, there's this small window of opportunity to present the instruction to the EEPROM before the next clock cycle. On the other hand, when I do use the 374, this window doesn't exist, and we have to wait to the next clock cycle to present the instruction to the EEPROM. What this means is that the instruction isn't incorporated until step 2, and step 1 is kind of wasted. Whereas the 373 is able to incorporate the new instruction in step 1. That means all instructions will be one step shorter using the 373. But the 374 may ultimately end up being the fastest solution, and I actually think this will be the case. Leave some comments below if you think you know why.